what we want to do is, is give retail insurance agents the tools that they need to not only survive, but thrive in the age of AI. Remarketing causes a bunch of extra work. It also compresses margins for agency because they're having to do more work to service their accounts, right? So, you know, with the tools that we've built, it immediately alleviates that. The people that are in your agencies, they're, they're hard to find. They're extremely hard to train. They're way too valuable. This technology is not here to replace them. It's here to give them, you know, 10x capabilities. I've gotten to see all of these technologies that have gotten developed as I'm kind of growing, and it makes it a whole lot easier for me to select the stuff that makes sense to invest in and the stuff that doesn't. Most brokers shouldn't be too scared of AI because it's going to be a long time before anybody wants to really interface the robot. I mean, you think about it like the insured, when something hits the fan, they don't call their carrier, they call you. We have really three designations within the analysis. There's what we call mentions, things that are included in the policy. <clears throat> there's exclusions, things that are listed and excluded from the policy. And there's omissions, right? And the omissions are what people always miss, right? Because they're not in there. So you mm -hmm. have to basically a library in your brain of what should be in this policy. I will always believe that the most deadly producers have an equal balance between their ability to sell and their technical knowledge. Everything that we've done from like a security standpoint in terms of like how we store data, all the way to like how we earn your trust is like very, very, very important to us. And that's an understatement itself. So the group of individuals that's concerned about it replacing <clears throat> their job or something like that are, are the same ones that are, you know, really slow to adapt to other technologies and the ones that are kind of stuck, you know, in, in the past. The agencies that we're working with, there's there's some large guys in there, right? Like, you know, anywhere from, you know, $10 million in annualized revenue all the way up to, you know, over a billion. And so the volume of information that's coming into our business is significant. There are agencies that, you know, that pride themselves on their sort of technical acumen and selling that way. And now every agency has access to that through it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. One of the ways we do that is with, oh man, what's the biggest buzzword of like the last 12 to 18 months, maybe even a little bit longer if you're a nerd, but if you're not, the <laughs> AI everywhere, man. Everybody's talking about AI. And today we're going to talk to Patrick Cooney from power broker AI about what they're doing that is going to absolutely change the game for producers and agents all over the country. What's up, Patrick? Hey, how are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. So before we get cranking, you got to establish a little credibility here and talk to everybody a little bit about your background and your journey to get to where you're at. And then I want to dive in and talk about Power Broker and spend as much time there as we can, because I think this is a really cool technology that everybody should hear about. Yeah, super excited too. Yeah, so I was uh, born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, come from a, a long line of insurance entrepreneurs. My grandfather came back from World War II, built an auto carrier that he that he sold to Infinity, which was is now Kemper. Uh, my father started CRC, so I grew up in the file rooms of that business, developed sort of my deep appreciation for the industry there. I have another uncle who's a vice chair at McGriff, and uh, one other uncle who's the managing director at Aon, helps run their reinsurance business. So one of those insurance families, like I said, grew up in the business. First job out of college was with a London-based wholesaler. Like I uh, literally just saw Tommy Boy, that <laughs> scene where it was like all of the different family members that all looked like Brian Dennehy. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it was just like that, right? So, uh, in London, couldn't people were like, oh, which Cooney are you related to? And I was like, great. Um, so, you know, it cuts both ways. But uh, le left the industry, worked in New York for a private equity firm for, you know, around four years, and then joined my first tech startup, uh, Blink Health, which is direct consumer pharmacy. I joined Blink as the third employee and became the director of business development there. It was my first time working inside of like a, a high growth uh, technology company, raised $176 million for that business, learned a ton, ended up leaving Blink, moving back to Birmingham, uh, and co-founded my own startup, uh, Sympio, which is an HR technology company and PEO. We scaled that business to, to an excess of $50 million in ARR and sold it in December of 2022. But since then, been working on Power Broker AI and joined by uh, now what's now a team of 12 folks, with my co-founders, Marcus Gallagher, background is in ML AI, uh, and then, you know, spent time at Attune and was the director of product at Coalition. So has deep understanding of broker workflows. And then David Olson, who's a former colleague from Blink Health, 
Dave's built and scaled multiple fintech companies and then other businesses in highly regulated industries. And Dave's involvement is super important from a security standpoint and infrastructure standpoint. So really excited to be building this business. Yeah, I mean... I don't know anybody we've ever had on that's got more DNA and, and genes in the insurance industry than, than what you do. It sounded kind of bland, honestly. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny because everybody's like, yeah, everybody else is like, I never intended to be in the insurance industry. And it's like, well, that's, that's true for sure. This guy would have been, house, yeah, you would have been disowned by the family if you did anything else, man, I feel like. But so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we've come full circle here. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, honestly though, it's it's cool though because if you look at what your family's done, just based on what you've described, I mean, they've impacted a ton of people, uh, whether it be through you know the carrier side or the wholesaler side. I mean, it's just you have a good name in insurance, as as far as I know. Like, I've, I don't ever hear anybody trashing you know the the name, um, and so. I think that definitely helps you, but you're getting ready to do kind of something the same, but different, and you're using modern technology to do it. So why don't you introduce everybody to Power Broker AI and, and talk a little bit about what it does, and then we'll get into some nuts and bolts questions and, and, and all of that. Yeah. So, you know, sort of our thesis is that, you know, retail agents are, you know, the most important part of the insurance value chain. Uh, if you look at it, Insured tax typically discounted the the retail relationship with the insured. They assumed initially that, you know, carriers, you know, carried the weight there. Simply not true, right? So what we want to do is, is give retail insurance agents the tools that they need to not only survive, but thrive in the age of AI. Um, and we know that they face a bunch of problems, right? They're probably used to these problems now, but, you know, finding new talent, uh, reading through policies, you know, comparing quotes, checking policies, feeding information into AMS and other systems takes a lot of time, compresses margins, right? Um, so what we're doing with Power Broker Eyes is solving a lot of those, right? We've built a brain for insurance. It has a cognitive fun function. It understands policies and it understands specific lines of coverage. Um, and it can evaluate those lines of coverage in less than five minutes. It can audit a policy. And if you think about it, typically takes a human anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours if they're burning through a policy to really look at sort of coverage. Um, and we can do that in five minutes. So we can 10X folks, right? It's really powerful. We can also compare documents. We can compare quotes. We can compare quotes to policies. We can compare policies to policies. And we can do that under a minute. Um, and we do it with repeatable accuracy. So there's a ton of scale for your business when you use Power Broker AI. Well, I look at it like this, man. I can say this. Because I, I know I'm going to get in trouble. Any of them. There's a lot of idiots out there peddling insurance that honestly need some sort of a backstop to help them on the technical side. And, you know, and there's also a lot of people that are newer in the industry and they have, they may have the sales acumen to go out and start opening opportunities, but they don't have that technical skill set yet. I will always believe that the most deadly producers have an equal balance between their ability to sell and their technical knowledge. I mean, I think. If there's anything at all that's set me up for success, it's the letters behind my name, in addition to the fact that I know how to open and close opportunities. But so so for me, yeah, do I have the ability to sit down and, and look at policies and, and compare quotes and, and specimens to what somebody already has? I absolutely do. Is that the best use of my time? That's the right. real question I have at this stage in my career. If I can go out and I can spend an hour or two hours prospecting and come back with a quarter million dollars of revenue opportunities in my pipeline that I just moved from suspect or, you know, from lead to suspect or suspect to prospect, I'm going to have a real hard time justifying sitting in my at my desk and going through and reviewing all this stuff. I also think that we may have those people in our operations on more of the fixed cost service side that have that skill set. But I don't know that I want them doing that either. I want them interfacing with my clients and making sure their needs are met and that we're delivering the best experience possible. So I look at what you guys have developed literally from, from several different angles. Number one, it gives producers time back to focus on revenue bearing activities. Number two, it gives service people the opportunity to not, you know, to always be available or be more available when needed if somebody calls and needs something in real time. 
And I also think that I was, by the way, people, if you didn't figure out I was being sarcastic about the idiots peddling insurance, I was kidding. But but for the younger people or, or the newer people to the industry, I should say, not necessarily younger people, it gives them a great way to learn. You know, yeah. you can you can go get your CIC, you can go get your your CPCU or whatever. But until you actually start putting that into practice and seeing what it looks like in the real world, at least if you learn like I do, that stuff doesn't stick. So being able to have yeah. something that does this and then now all of a sudden you're connecting dots you might not have connected on your own. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you know, even if you're a senior producer, right? I mean, obviously you may be specialized, you may be a generalist, but to have, you know, a wide range of technical acumen across every line of coverage is really hard to do. And it's hard to do it with repeatable accuracy, right? So scale is difficult there. Um, when you use Power Broker AI, you get that instantly. And the good news is you could be with a with a prospect or a customer on a golf course. You could be somewhere else in the world. You could wake up in the middle of the night and you can send us information. You'll get it back, right? Uh, in no time flat. So it's like, that's really powerful. And, and then this is very much an apprenticeship industry, right? That senior producer, junior producer relationship, if it does exist, right, it's definitely accelerated. That learning process is accelerated through the tool. I mean, the analysis that we provide back, it starts at a high level and then it becomes very, very granular. We go in and we provide reasoning. We list endorsements. We understand and read the endorsements. So it's a really powerful tool. It creates, I think, scale within your organization. Um, it's like it's giving you the ability to improve margin and revenue without increasing headcount, essentially, right? And that's where that's what I think agencies need more than ever right now. I think it's going to keep you from missing things too, right? I mean, because like it's very easy, especially today, to get distracted with with anything. I mean, you get a as a producer, you get a call that comes in, you get a lead that comes in that you that you okay, I'm going to stop reviewing this policy because this isn't necessarily something that's going to generate revenue for me right now, and I'm going to do that. And you forget, maybe forget where you were. Or you you know, have to reply to an email, like in, anything could happen. I think it, I think it closes the door for, um, you know, for errors and, and just losing your train of thought and, and something that is, is really important can slip through. Well, I think yeah, the other I, thing too, man, is with as many people as are quote, like, I would argue that agencies are probably quoting the most business they've quoted in the last two decades right now for as hard as the market is. And I see a huge gap between what the quote, what you ask for, what the quote says, and ultimately what the bound policy says. And I think that because of the volume of paper or email, you know, and I'd say paper figuratively, because a lot of it's electronic right now, but just because of the sheer volume, I see a lot of agencies out there, you know, and I feel like we're susceptible to this, just like everybody else that are going to miss one step in that process where you're not comparing the quote and specimens to the current policy that the person has, or you're not comparing the issued policy to what was on the quote. And I think that, you know, we're opening ourselves up to some significant E&O exposure because we're moving so fast that it's easy to say, oh, no, it's probably good. I've worked with that that wholesaler for 15 years, they've not made a mistake yet. Well, then guess what? They're overloaded too. So, yeah. you know, it's a matter of checks and balances and holding each other accountable without having to invest all the time to do that. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. I mean, remarketing causes a bunch of extra work. It also compresses margins for agency because, because they're having to do more work to service their accounts. Right. So, you know, with the tools that we've built it, it immediately alleviates that. Um, and, and you're starting to see it work and work well. I mean, you know, you brought up an important point, which is like, you know, what did we miss or what have we missed in our existing book in terms of coverage, right? We we have customers that have us auditing their entire book day one, just so they can have it on file and they can review it, you know, 90 days before renewal if they need to, right? They can go in it and they can go ahead, get way ahead of the curve. And the idea is, I mean, everyone's familiar with these big sort of re renewal dates. It's like, how do you get out of the habit of making things last minute? Well, you have a tool like this that accelerates all the work. Yeah. I mean, talk about that for a second. I mean, what does that look like? You just said that you have agencies that have you looking at their entire book. I mean, I would certainly be somebody who would who would think that would make a whole lot of sense for us. Yeah. We, we go in and we design curated audits with the agents, uh, agency, right? So, you know, we, whether it's, you know, based on when the policies renew or if they just want it done as quickly as possible, we figure out sort of how they want the information transferred and set up. Uh, and we begin doing that for them. And it's really easy for us, you know, because at the end of the day, we have 
a really great control over the data that we're that we're utilizing. Um, and so the other important thing too is we can we can begin to you know create additional insights for these businesses through data intelligence and business intelligence, which is also super important. We're not there quite yet, but we're headed in that direction. But yeah, curated audits are something that we plan with our customers and and do for them on on sort of a recurring basis. So you guys are relatively new, relatively. Yeah. I'm trying to think of how I want to form my question. Um, how have you been able to establish trust, I guess? That's probably, I, I, in, I don't want to, obviously I'm trying not to offend you because in no way means do I plan to do that. But, you know, I think that we're skeptical and I say we as a peer group uh, are skeptical of just allowing access to any information. I mean, and we've, we've had, you know, people from the people from Arius analytics come on and talk about Donna for agents and how it can integrate with your AMS. We've talked about, you know, we have uh, Leo and, and Scott Angel and Leary Halperin from from Leo talk about how they can comb through your AMS and and give you curated leads lists based on the business you're already successfully writing. I know there's carriers like Hanover out there that will strap on to your AMS if they're looking to appoint your agency and they're going to get all of that data. And I think that's a major trust fall for the average agent to just say, here, yeah, absolutely. Here's my life's blood worth of data. You know, I want to make sure that you have access to every single thing you can have. I, I just feel like if if I were in your shoes, I would be facing that as if it were some kind, somewhat of a roadblock to be able to establish trust. But I have to believe that's overcome relatively quickly once the work product's delivered. How have you how have you faced that challenge? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great question. Uh, I mean, this is a trust driven industry, uh, and you know that's something that we knew from the get go, right? Uh, everything that we've done from like a security standpoint in terms of like how we store data all the way to like how we earn your trust is like very, very, very important to us. And that's an understatement itself. So, you know, earning trust, you know, we define trust internally as security first, accuracy second, and then speed last. Speed's important, but it's not nearly as important as the first two. We actually have the security protocol that's that's proprietary where we, we, we do work to de-identify your information and your the insured's information, right? And and I can't discuss that because it's a bit of our secret sauce. I'm happy to discuss it with any prospect or customer though. Second thing is like in terms of accuracy, how we trained our system. Uh, we we went through rigorous audits. We go through ongoing audits to basically maintain accuracy. And we don't release a line of coverage on our system until we have this 0% discrepancy rate, which is super important. But more than anything, it's, it's you know, when we when we begin to work with a customer, right, we typically let them test the system over a period of time to give them sort of the ability to trust it. And then what's exciting about that is like if within the the coverage standard that we created, because we created a coverage standard for every line of coverage, right, what should shouldn't be in the policy, et cetera, specific to every line of coverage, they will come in and they'll say, hey, we kind of want to look for this in the policy, and we have the ability just given based on how we structured our system to create that customization for them and limit it only to their agency, which is really great. So that's, those are some things that we do to earn trust. It does take, it, it's, it's a shorter period of time for some agencies and it's a longer period of time for other folks. Right. But um, I would say with any vendor that you're working in the space with now, you know, especially if they're going to be outsourcing information to either foreign assets or third parties uh, I would be I would begin scrutinizing that heavily just because I think we're going to see sort of in the age of AI, new security risks that that haven't really come to to uh, the surface until now. Well, mm -hmm. shoot, man, we were talking about it. We had Zane Gothrop from Pro Riders on, and I asked him the question: How far do you think we are away from having cyber policies issued with six month terms or even month to month? Because so much changes that by the time you bind a policy, it's probably obsolete. There's going to be three or four new things that haven't been contemplated by the policy that would likely be covered by a policy that a carrier is going to want to get their arms around. I mean, I, I, it just, it moves so quickly. It, it just, it's crazy to even think about, but, you know, I think the other thing is an agency principle. What's running through my mind is I I'm, really anxious to see you guys get enough critical mass 
to where you can come out with some statistics to talk about how much time you give back to the average, you know, agency in terms of how many staff members did you save them? You know, you made the comment about, you know, the trust uh, and all of that based on my, the question I, I asked you, I also think that there, it's, it's probably like the, the older your agency, the more established, the less likely you are to trust somebody. And then yeah. you got, you know, scratch agents, and people like me who came in are like, nah, Tiff, go for it, man. Whatever you whatever you got that's going to make my life easier. Because I feel like, and that's not a knock on the older, more established agencies, but I feel like I, I started Florida Risk eight years ago and I correlate it to the fact, the same thing is like when I went to college, the internet really didn't exist yet. You know, we didn't, mm -hmm. email wasn't commonplace. Yeah. Prodigy and Net, Netscape and AOL were all sending out the, the DVDs and the floppy disks in the mail and everything. But like you were the aristocracy, if you had email access and, and you, you went on the internet when I was in the early nineties, for sure, late eighties, early nineties. I think, you know, the path of my agency has been somewhat similar to that because I've gotten to see all of these technologies that have gotten developed as I'm kind of growing. And it makes it a whole lot easier for me to select the stuff that makes sense to invest in and the stuff that doesn't. So, you know, I don't even know where I was going with that other than I'm I'm telling the people out there like, if you think that this is something that scares you a little bit, you might as well plan on being scared for a while because it's not going to go away. This is only going to become more commonplace and more refined. And I've always been of the mindset. I would rather be an early adopter and use a product that's not perfect yet. Not saying that that's your case, you know, with Power Broker AI. I'm I'm just saying that like that's I'll I'll use a name with Leo, for example. I've been a very early, early adopter of Leo. And I did that intentionally because I knew that they wanted feedback. And if I have the ability to give that feedback and help steer and control the experience for the future based on what I'm going through with it now, I'm going to do that 10 out of 10 times, man. I would much rather have input into the technology than buy it after a bunch of other people who don't think necessarily like I do gave their two cents. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, the <clears throat> we see... You know, large agencies, maybe more established agencies, um, you know, they I mean, the timeline to adopt is it, it can be a little bit longer. Now, they're, they're typically looking at it from a very sort of set framework of like, how does this fit into my business from an operational standpoint? They're also checking the boxes behind security and accuracy and all that. Right. Um, that being said, we work with some of the biggest agencies in the country and we work with a swath of middle market guys. And then we work with some super small agencies, like one, two man shops type deal. And I'll tell you that the value prop is, you know, at, it's for these, for these larger organizations. Um, you know, you look at sort of like, obviously time savings, new revenue generation, margin improvement. Um, but for the small agencies, it's like a Swiss army knife. It really mm -hmm. loves the playing field, you know? And it's like, I think over time, what you're going to see technology do is enable the individual agent and producer to really handle a lot, you know? Well, I mean, I look at it like this, man. When I launched, I, it was me in the dining room of my home. And yeah. I joke about it and say that, you know, the first my first employee was two pieces of technology, one to audit the experience mod and the other one to kind of be the treatment plan for that diagnosis. And I knew that if I had those pieces of technology and I prospected correctly, I could scale the agency by myself relatively easily without having to invest in human capital. And so, you know, I think that that's a really, really good point because, you know, I'm not saying I would do anything differently than what I did or that I would change the business that I have now, but to your point, I think it opens the door of opportunity for a lot of people who are maybe successful producers that just decide, you know what, I'm going to open up my own shop. I have the ability to leverage technology. I don't need to go invest in, in bricks and mortar. I don't need to go invest in a bunch of, of human talent to be there. I, I probably need an account manager and maybe a CSR. But other than that, I don't have to build an agency. You know, I yeah. could just build a really big book of business and live very comfortably and call it a day. And I think it's interesting because 
you know, we're a very hypocritical group of people as agency principals and producers in that we'll do one thing, but then we'll, we'll shun something else. Right. So, you know, we've got people out there that, that are likely pushing back on some of the AI technology, yet they have no problem going to a third world country and hiring a VA direct with no security protocol that has access to the same amount of data or more. Yeah. It is more mission critical to their business. So if you're one of those that's listening to this, number one, congratulations. This is a podcast. It might be your first. Um, but number two, you know, I, I just can't believe anybody would use a VA or outsource any kind of human capital, but not be willing to consider AI. Because I have to believe AI is more secure than the average VA relationship that people have today. Yeah. I mean, I think you brought up a good point too, which is, you know, um, it's sort of doing more with what you have, right? And the people that are in your agencies, they're they're hard to find. They're extremely hard to train. They're way too valuable. This technology is not here to replace them. It's here to give them, you know, 10x capabilities. And so I think that you just look at whether you're a larger agency or you know a small agency, you look at bringing scale to your business with with this tool. And I think that, you know, maybe that's part of the trust thing is like, is this going to eliminate my job? And it's simply not at this phase. That's not the way we're building our company, at least. Um, and I think that, you know, from a security protocol standpoint, it's like if you're, yeah, you, you made a great point. Like if you're if you're offshoring information, you know, the second that it leaves the United States and other humans touching to get somewhere else, there's just even more risk. So, you know, the, the, we're, we're proud of the fact that we're based here in the U.S., that all of our data is warehoused here. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that we like to stand on. Yeah, I, I I think that like the group of individuals that's concerned about it replacing <clears throat> their job or something like that are are the same ones that are you know really slow to adapt other technologies and the ones that are kind of stuck, um, you know, in in the past really. I mean, um, we've talked about that a bunch on, well, on the I, pod I'm before. Like the crusty lady that used to sit at the front of the state <laughs> farm office when I would go with my dad for his annual policy review every yeah. year that had just about a ripping Marlboros. Just crushing fucking... it. it. Had like a <laughs> an inch and a half ash just <laughs> dangling off of her, her lip when she was talking at you, typing up policy binders with the typewriter. Like I think that the people that would be against this are the people who actually love to sit and read insurance policies. <laughs> Like and there is a subset there, there. There's a subset of people out there that are like that. That's just not your ideal prospect, man. Right. Yeah. There, there, there's such a small number of people who really enjoy doing that that I, I can't imagine. You know that, that there's a long line of people pushing back for that reason. But it just reminds me of the people that I would go and speak with when I was, you know, at Coad doing the, the the PEO stuff. Who were like, we would come in with the solution, you know, to help give them time back and take things off their plate. And they would be like, well, you're going to put me out of a job. They're like, no, we need someone to fly this ship. Like that, that's, that's you. Um, well, even you know. with the VA stuff, man, like if, you, if, if you're going to think about bringing a virtual assistant or virtual professional in to your operation, you know, one of the things that I've always told agencies to do is pull your staff. What are the things you hate doing the most? And when you, when you get that list of the stuff that they hate, Usually that's the stuff the VAs are the absolute best at, and it's the easiest to trust them with. So, you know, let them be, and I mean, I guess that's, that's kind of a sales technique to a certain degree, because you're having to sell your staff on why you're outsourcing some of what they're doing. But if you can say, but it's all the stuff you told me you hated, like it, it makes it such a softer blow. So, I mean, I think that if this is something that I, you know, if I'm in an agency that was worried about how my staff was going to perceive it, that's how I would get their buy-in is I would ask them, tell me the things about your job that are the things that you really don't like. And I'm just going to bank on the fact that policy review, quote review, all of that stuff is going to show up on that list multiple times. At that point, there's really no argument, right? Because now what I'm doing is I'm taking all the crap off your plate that you don't like so you can focus on doing the things you do like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also think like, you know, <clears throat> there's a there's a line of, there's a line which is like, you know, sanity at work, right? Like when people are grinding through big renewal dates, I don't care what, who you are and what your tenure is. It's like, you probably don't enjoy that amount of work at once. This tool reduces that, right? You still are in it. You're still doing it, but maybe you're interfacing with customers more and where the impact is much more important too, right? So I think that like, 
that's sort of the way to look at it. And most of the people that we've met as we've gone to market, and we have, you know, over 30 customers now, it's like <clears throat> they're most people see this and they're like, finally, I get to enjoy one one like everybody else, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we saw, you know, we had like a there's a team that was scaling a, an organization that was scaling up their marketing team and was going to hire five other professionals. And after they used our tool to work through one one renewals, they they basically downgraded their hiring forecast to two people, saved their company 750k. You know, like, and I also think it broadens the sort of talent funnel for agencies. Right? It's like now maybe you don't need to go find people that have. X, Y, Z amount of acumen. It's like, can you get a junior producer that, that's just really good at interfacing with folks that may not have the ability to be super technical that could lean on this tool, right? And still interface mm -hmm. with another broker, right? Can you, can you find maybe younger account executives that enjoy doing this work as it's enhanced with this tool, right? So, you know, we'll see those things sort of evolve over time, but um, a lot of good case studies that have come up from our earliest customers that I think we're really excited about. So let, let's let's talk about that a little bit. My, that kind of led me into my next question is that you guys have gotten up and running. You got, you said about 30 clients or so now. What's been one of the main, I guess, points of feedback that you've gotten? Um, or maybe something that you guys thought, okay, this is how this is going to look. And then as things started, you know, coming in and you've got some feedback that, um, you know, maybe, maybe it needs to be different. Yeah, I think that what we saw very early on was, you know, we we created for every line of coverage, we basically created a coverage standard. And we really leaned into the industry to, to build those coverage standards for every line of coverage. I think what we saw very early on was, you know, every agency has, sort of has these big pain points, but they all work a little different. They all require some unique customization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of the way we've built our organization and the technology, we're able to do that. So, you know, one area that we sort of began to tweak was around sort of this deeper customization around how and what agencies look for, like uniquely in policies and being able to customize the software for those agencies really started to move the needle. Um, we saw people that maintained what we call like a coverage standard for their agencies that were retiring. And they were like, if you could just build my brain into this, I can retire a little bit sooner. It was things like that that I think really excite the industry of like, all right, now we've got a process of how we audit and evaluate policies, whether it's for new or renewal business, whatever it may be, that scales and scales well, right? Um, and now, you know, there, I mean, there are agencies that, you know, that pride themselves on their sort of technical acumen and selling that way. And now every agency has access to that through us. So, you know, it's things like that where we saw sort of these unique opportunities to tweak things. I think we found new problems that we really want to solve. I mean, data mobility within an organization is typically poor. You know, four to five people touch one document on average. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like we, we like thinking about how we can solve that, make it easier for those stakeholders to work and collaborate. So it's things like that, I think, that, that that excite us. How many times are you guys getting in and finding errors? Like, especially when you do an audit for agencies? Oh, I mean, the it's it's not really the errors, right? It's the it's it's what's in the policy. We're not trying to point at somebody and be like, hey, you know, you missed this. Look, it's an well, omission. Hey, look, I don't care if you do or not. If it's mine, <laughs> I want to make sure you point it out, not the competition if I make a mistake. Yeah, but, yeah but, I, I mean, I think what Kyle's saying is when you go in and, um, and do an audit, What's that average report look like, I guess, you know, when you, when, when it comes out, how much are you actually, how much feedback are you actually giving to that client and saying, these are all the things we think you need to pay attention to based on our review? Yeah. So it's highly granular. So we have really three designations within the analysis. There's what we call mentions, things that are included in the policy. <clears throat> there's exclusions, things that are listed and excluded from the policy and there's omissions, Right. And the omissions are what people always miss, right? Because they're not in there. So you mm -hmm. have to have basically a library in your brain of what should be in this policy. And there's only so many people in the industry that know how to do that. We see omissions regularly, you know? And then what's great is as we go into that, right? <clears throat> as we dive deeper into the analysis, we become very granular. We list sp specific page numbers, the reasoning behind either the exclusion, the importance of it, right? We list endorsements, we read the endorsements, you know? And then I think more importantly, it's like, you know, finding the omissions and surfacing to those, those to people is, it's important because whether it's the underwriter's fault or maybe the underwriter forgot or whatever it may be, those, those omissions are typically hard to find. So it becomes very granular. We also, you know, we generate sort of like 
talking points for customers. So maybe if they're teasing a prospect, they don't have to they don't have to send them everything. They could just simply send out send out you know three or four sales points where the policy is weak. Um, and so it's things like that, right? Where where I think that you know we really try to create value for the customer, but it's very in depth. Um, it's it's on a regular basis you see omissions. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it, you know every single policy typically has one to two omissions in it. Interesting. So I think I've made some assumptions. I mean, in terms of comparing quotes, comparing current policies, like what does the average when when somebody set um, engages with you to do an audit like that, what are you typically reviewing? Are you typically comparing what's currently written versus a proposal? Are you comparing what is issued versus what was quoted? All of the above. Yeah. So you know, it depends. So for just a you know for let's say it's a prospect policy, that use case, right? That's typically just getting in a policy and looking for coverage deficiencies, right? That's what we're looking for there. If we get into the renewal workflow, right? And we're comparing quotes, you know, then we're comparing quote to quote or quote to policy, quote the expiring policy, right? Um, and then, you know, if there's just a, a, a straight audit that we're doing, sometimes that's just auditing every single policy so they have it on file, Right. Uh, and then auditing the, and looking at the quotes as well. So it's just trying to create sort of a forensics trail for, for these folks in a, in a one-off audit. But um, and the other in the other cases, it's you know either prospecting or uh, renewals. So like pro- like like taking a look at someone. I go out and I'm prospecting a client. I get their you know deck page, their their policy, whatever. And it's, and it's taking that and, you know, trying to find some deficiencies in there. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. You're doing an audit, right. Of mm-hmm. that policy. And you're looking at, and you're going to get back and you're going to see where the exclusions are and all the omissions in it and what's in there as well. Right. Talk about that part a little bit, like what that report looks like, like, you know, that comes back to me as a producer. So I can say, okay, here, look, and take that as a sales tool when I go and, and meet with these guys. Yeah. So we've had some case studies here where like, you know, a junior you know, unvalidated producer used the tool and won like $250,000 gross written premium account, you know, and he was having difficulty before, but what it looks like is they're, they're basically submitting it to the system. The system in three to five minutes is going to turn around the audit, right? Or the analysis, mm-hmm. the analysis, again, it's broken down into mentions, what's in the policy exclusions, right? What's been specifically taken out of the policy and then the omissions, what's got it silent, right? And then it gets very, very granular from there on. It's going to tell you exactly where it is in the policy, provides all the reasoning, the logic, the endorsements that may be associated with it, right? So you can get as granular as you want in selling somebody at this point. And it's specific, that coverage standard, it's unique to every line of coverage available through our system. So it's it's unique. It's like you have technical acumen across every line now. Um, so you don't have to steer away from certain lines if you don't feel comfortable selling them, right? So here's my question, man. And I'm thinking like, I'm trying to think like a skeptical agency owner uh, out there that that wants to put water on your blazing fire. I've heard you say that you're new. I've heard you say you have 30 clients. That doesn't sound like a huge number to me. How much capacity do you have? Like if we bury you with opportunity coming out of the podcast, how easy is it? And I don't want this to sound like a tough question. It's more of a softball for you to say, we can grow as fast as we need to because of how we're, how we're set up, but, you know, get rid of that, get rid of that thought process for me. How, how much can you scale? How many agencies can you handle right now with the current setup? Yeah. I mean, the, so the, the agencies that we're working with, there's, there's some large guys in there, right? Like, you know, anywhere from, you know, $10 million in annualized revenue all the way up to, you know, over a billion. And so the volume of information that's coming into our business is significant. And I say that because, you know, there's not a human in the loop here. That's important. There's going to be other people that enter the market. And there's a lot of people that outsource, you know, overseas. There's human beings doing this work. Um, and those folks, they have difficulty scaling. We don't. So, you know, um, we can we can handle any volume of information. Um, you know, for us, it, and, you know, setting up a customer takes very little time for us, roughly 30 minutes, right? We want to provide some education to you and your employees, and then after that, we we get you set up in the system. There's no, this is not you having to yank out any software. We're not having to build any unique integrations at this point. 
So it's very scalable. It's very efficient. Um, and we, we maintain the software too. We, we have an ongoing audit process to ensure accuracy. You know, it's, it's um, you know, we, we realize what our obligation is and it's to, to keep and earn the trust of these agencies. So. So we've talked a little bit about how AI is kind of constantly changing or at, at least at a very rapid pace. Like what do you, what do you see, you know, coming, coming down the pike here? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the entire insurance value chain or like for, for our business or just the, the industry. Uh, well, like, like just, yeah, don't, don't give us your roadmap of proprietary yeah. secrets, man. But no. I mean, just general, general ideas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I think a big part of it is, you know, if you look at the insurance value chain, you've got, you know, you basically have retailers, wholesalers, and it's all fragmented and you get into the carriers and you sort of like the carrier networks, the MGAs, MGUs, right. Um, and it's just a very fragmented value chain. Uh, and what's interesting is it reminds me a lot of the, the American pharmaceutical value chain. You know, the people who are actually taking and buying the medication are like the furthest from the understanding of what they're actually getting and buying. I think what you're going to see happen is more intelligence is going to move downstream towards the insured, right? Um, so things like understanding purchasing decisions, right? Like, you know, you have a limited ability to tell your retail, your insured, the insured, why they should be buying the insurance that they're buying, right? It's hard for you to go out and say, hey, this is what the entire market looks like, right? It's things like that where I think AI are going to be able to take data that retailers are sitting on and turn it into a tool that provides significant insight for businesses, right? So I think things like that are coming. I think that carrier connectivity is going to be top of mind for most people. Um, you know, there's a lot. So there's a lot of people that are trying to move into the space. There's a lot of people that are right. trying to understand insurance. So, well, I know there's a lot of venture capital money going into it, and that means that there's opportunity there. VCs aren't going to circle around and, and start dumping money into insure tech if they don't think they're ultimately going to have the big winner. Arguments could be made that you know there's been maybe more money lost than's been made thus far, but I think that stands true for everything. You you know yeah as far as that goes. So it's just going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, man, because again, we're limited in terms of a, a lot of us are limited in terms of what we can think because we're, we limit ourselves as to what we allow ourselves to see right now. If yeah. you can see what's out there and you can see how it's being used, it op opens up your eyes to be able to see other applications or, or use cases for this stuff. And I mean, that's one of the things I feel like I'm, I'm actually probably ahead of my, let's call it my age division in insurance. I mean, I'm in my early fifties at this point. And so I, I feel like I do see a lot of opportunity and use case things because I'm willing to, to be open-minded about how this stuff is used. Ultimately what I see is a lot more time for me to spend time with my family and travel and do the things I like to do because I'm not chained to my desk having to, you know, review policies and all of that other stuff. So, I mean, for, for that reason alone, I think, you know, I'm invested in AI and taking more physical work off of our plates. Yeah. yeah. I think it makes a ton of sense. So we've been going for about 45 minutes, man. What have we missed? Oh, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I think the one thing I'd say is that, you know, the, the EQ, the emo, sort of the emotional intelligence that it requires the retail broker to have the relationship with the insured is probably the most insulating thing. It's the one thing that I don't see AI being able to replicate. And so I, I think that, you know, part of it too is like most brokers shouldn't be too scared of AI because it's going to be a long time before anybody wants to really interface with the robot. I mean, you think about it like the insured, when something hits the fan, they don't call their carrier, they call you. Mm -hmm. you know? And that well, whole- I mean, did it, Has it even actually even worked at McDonald's yet? Like, I mean, I see McDonald's, yeah. like they wanted to put those kiosks in for people to be able to order it and, and streamline operations. And I see McDonald's hiring people for like 20 bucks an hour down here. If, if that <laughs> yeah. would have worked so well in that environment, we wouldn't be paying people more than they've ever paid before. Not to mention the fact like 
people don't know how to use the stuff, man. <laughs> like the, yeah. the one that takes longer. It's not, it's to... not, it's not as easy as just being like, dude, give me a number two, you know, right. no pickles. Like you, you got to go search and... for it. Then you got to yeah. make sure you customize what you want and all of that. Right. Like, listen, there are people who just want the, the number. Like, look, I'm going to get the number seven at breakfast at McDonald's. Every time I go Two burritos, is that the, hash is that brown. The, oh, yeah, the burritos. Every, every single time. It's Sausage, egg, happen. McMuffin guy, and the McGriddles. You can't beat McGriddles or two fire. But, but I know what I'm getting, and I know what the number is, right? Like, it was yeah. a hard enough leap to get me to order from the app before I would, you know, so that it was ready <laughs> yeah. when I got there. Same. Now, let me be very clear. It has been months since I've had McDonald's breakfast, so it's not like it's a daily driver for me. But Yeah, I went last week. Even then, I would know what I was ordering when I went, and I know what the experience would be because it's predictable, right? So yeah, to, to Patrick's point, there's I, I don't think – I think there are very few businesses where it would be able to be completely human-free. I, right. I just – I don't see it happening. Yeah. It's, it's not now at all. And it's not probably for the next 10 years either, so – I mean, the bottom line is when people have questions, they want to reach out and talk to us. Like if it's something like even just think about homeowners, like, I mean, it's got to deal with your most likely biggest asset and, you know, it's something that is like really important to you. You want, if you, if you have some serious questions, you want to actually know that you're talking to a person in my yeah. opinion. I feel like most people are like that and there may be some that aren't, but um, that's just kind of how I see it. No, I think that's what the studies have shown too. Even the millennials that you would expect to be more ingrained in the technology piece, they they want an agent. They want somebody yeah. they can ask those questions to for, for those reasons. And I I found that to be interesting, but you know, they just they don't know what they don't know and are smart enough to realize, well, wait a minute, why would I go buy this online from somebody if I can't even like I don't even what's uninsured motorist like they're, they're by the time you start getting into this stuff man and you click links to watch videos and get educated it also takes them longer than it does to just fill out a quote form and have us get in touch with them right so like how do you know what'd you say a million rabbit holes you can go down yeah exactly down. you get get lost ends up taking more, more time than than it would have in raising more questions than you probably had to begin with but um, I mean, so like, what, what's the best way to, to engage with you guys, Patrick? Like, you know, how, if somebody like you guys do like a demo, like how, do, how does it work? Who do yeah, you reach so, out to? Yeah. So typically, you know, I mean, I'm happy to supply my information. People can reach out directly to me. I'm happy to, you know, drink from a fire hose. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's very simple, you know, we'll do sort of a demo of the software. We set you up for, uh, you know, sort of a test pilot of the software just for, for a finite period of time. And then uh, from there, we work through the agreement and you're good to go. Um, very simple, very straightforward. At the end of the day, we want the, we want you to to use the software and to trust it. And if you trust it and like it, then, you know, subscribe. So re really easy, but it creates a ton of value on, you know, the production and, uh, and the account side of the business on the service side of the business. Um, I mean, it's unlocking revenue for a bunch of folks now and, and we're excited to continue growing the business. So. Well, here's something I'm going to say. Um, you will be pleasantly, and I'm not going to ask you to disclose pricing or anything like that on the podcast. What I am going to say is y'all would be pleasantly surprised at the price point for this. So if you think, oh, okay, when's the other shoe going to drop? This thing's going to cost me, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, blah, 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 blah. I, I'll tell you that's not the case. So I would encourage you to reach out to Patrick and the team at Power Broker AI and get that demo and let him talk to you about what the actual costs are that you would uh, incur from this. And it's not even a difficult piece of math to figure out the cost benefit analysis. It's literally a no brainer. Yeah. We're super transparent with pricing, uh, no smoke and mirrors there. Um, you know, we want you to have a good understanding of what, what this is going to cost your agency and, you know, be able to work fearlessly. So, you know, we're straightforward there. Cool. Well, listen, man, I'm going to be respectful of your time. I think it's time that we go ahead and wrap up. We got, I got another one right after this that I got to get ready for too, but I, I appreciate you coming on, man. I really do. Um, 
it's always good to hear new technology and things that are pushing the envelope. And I mean, all I can say is what's this conversation look like three years from now, you know, yeah. or even <laughs> next year for that matter. I mean, mm -hmm. but I, I would encourage everybody. This is, this is not going to go away. You know, we've had a couple of people on the podcast that have talked similarly, but power brokers really the first one we've talked to that is a hundred percent non-human involved on the, on the review side. And I would, I would be interested in y'all checking it out and getting back to us with your thoughts and your feedback, because this is something we're going to do at Florida risk. There is no question. And I would be very interested in somebody else's opinion. Tell me I'm an idiot. Tell me I'm onto something, whatever that is. But I just want to thank you for spending time today, uh, sharing with us, Patrick. I, I'm excited about what you're doing, both, uh, for you personally, but also professionally and what you're going to do to change the industry. Cause I think you're going to make us better. You're going to help us hold each other accountable in an easier way. And, uh, you know, I'm all for it. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate it guys. Thanks for y'all's time and for having me on. Absolutely. For sure. Have a good one. See Later. You.